Lewis, thank you so much for joining uh, me today about this topic that a lot of couples are worried about, which is house hunting. You've been doing this for many years. This is actually your second time on the podcast, so welcome back. I, I love having you over in the first time. You've been a, a wealth of knowledge, and I can't wait to pick your brain with house hunting. The great thing about like living in Raleigh, and we were house hunting years ago, is there are many options. I mean, we have developments, even like across the street, new developments coming in, and then we have some fantastic neighborhoods with existing homes. I noticed when we were looking, there were some differences when we're housing. So I was wondering, could you go over for a couple um, that's looking like the pros and cons and what that are, what would be a, a good fit for them? Well, in, in today's market, one of the biggest challenges that we have is the, the inventory of available homes. Whereas we may have in, in the triangle area, 15 to 20,000 properties available at any given time for sale. Today, we have just over 7,000. Yeah, that just gives you an idea of uh, you know, the, some of the challenges that we have in finding properties. And so what that's done, it is really incentivized builders to build very aggressively and, and broadly. So you have uh, many, many large construction companies that are operating in the area, builders, regional build builders, national builders that are just vying for any piece of land that they can find and trying to build homes just as fast as they can. Um, in some markets where we historically have had new construction uh, market penetration of maybe uh, 15 to 20 percent, we now have 70 percent of ho available homes are new construction. Wow. So, yeah. So that puts a lot of pressure on buyers because obviously when you buy something that's new, you're going to pay, you know, pay a, a slight premium on that as opposed to, to buying something resale. And there's, you know, quite, quite a few differences between new construction mm -hmm. and retail homes when it comes to, to pricing, to character, um, to development of the property and, and the neighborhood in general. So there's a, you know, there are definite considerations that, that any home buyer should make. Yeah. I noticed when we were hunting, uh, the first time we did a, a new build, it was a townhouse. And we had an HOA with that new development. The second time, uh, we got a, an older home in an existing neighborhood with no HOAs. Have you noticed that, like, in any trends um, in the Raleigh area with HOAs? To me, I mean, I'm, I'm just a regular person. Notice more and more in moving that direction. Yeah, and, and, and so historically, HOAs will, will be enforced when a new development forms, and then they, they, they tend to expire after a period of time, and that tends to be 20 to 30 years unless they're renewed by covenants. Hmm. Most every new development will have an HOA, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That really aids the neighborhood and its development and, and the culture that, that, that it forms, um, because, you know, you, you have all these different personalities and, and, you know, moving into the neighborhood. So it can go in any, any number of different directions. And so the, the covenants kind of put rails on it and kind of guide the development of the neighborhood. Listen, you can't change colors to this. There has to be uniformity in the structure. You can't park commercial cars in front of the house. So HOAs are not necessarily a bad thing. It can help the neighborhood develop to where it was intended to go. But it can be problematic for some people, you know, if they have um, a larger number of, of pets, um, than is typical. And I just met someone and they had six dogs. So that oh. may not be permissible in most HOAs, but but there are some areas that they can find a nice home. That's a good point. Something to keep in mind. Because I do know like there's some HOAs are very, I guess you could lax. It, it, like you said, they just have the basic guardrails. They want to make sure the neighborhood is kept well, the maintenance taken care of. And then of course we hear in, in the papers, the nightmare HOAs with all of the rules and regulations. But when you're house hunting, you could request, like, say, if you're looking at that, to look at the HOA, um, I guess, guidelines for the neighborhood ahead of time? Okay. Yeah, because those covenants are recorded at the, the inception of the neighborhood. They get recorded at the Register of Deeds. So anybody okay. can go into the public records at the Register of Deeds of you know, respective county and then do a search by the name of the HOA. And if you look at the name of the uh -huh. HOA, whether it's Wakefield Plantation or Briar <laughs> Creek, you can yeah. search in there and you'll see the covenants come up and then just read the, the covenants that are that apply to your particular property. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Always go in and, and get your research done. Now, I know a lot of us love watching ATTV and DIY Network and we fall in love like this idea of getting a fixer upper. You know, we've, we're told like, hey, you can get this house and you can fix it up. You'll be saving money in the long run. This is a, a, a great thing, uh, real estate, you can snag deal. But then there's the other side of the coin where you have couples like us, not so handy, 
And so we're, I guess, more apprehensive about like, I don't want to get stuck with a money pit. So with your experience, because you have both sides. I mean, you do the real estate, but you've also fixed up um, and you have explicit you know, um, construction and everything. What things should a couple look out for that are definitely like going to be expensive uh, fixes or improvements versus the more cosmetic that they can always outsource that or schedule that out later? Okay. So in my experience, mm-hmm. everyone's maintenance issues is predicated upon your purchase decision. Um, you have to look past your first initial or, you know, your emotional response to the property because we're all visual, right? Mm -hmm. And so people will walk into a property and they're based on their opinion. They're forming their opinion on the property based on what they see, but they're not really looking at the details behind the Mm -hmm. property. So there are three key components to every home. There's the the foundation and structure. You have Mm -hmm. the mechanicals and plumbing, which is like your, your air conditioning system, your hot water heater, as well as the plumbing pipe itself. And then you have the surface finishes, which is what we're really uh, responding to when we enter a home, we look at the wood floors, we look at the quality of the cabinets, the paint surfaces, et cetera. Um, And I really encourage buyers to take a close look at the foundation and the structure, make sure that that is sound and that'll be determined um, by any competent home inspector. I always recommend doing a home inspection, even in new construction homes. It's always a mm. inspection, absolutely. And then, if you don't want to, uh, you know, entrap yourself in a money pit, you want to make sure that the mechanical systems of the property have been updated. You want to make sure that the air conditioning is in good shape and, and in working order. And that is one key component that a lot of people allow their home inspector to test. Mm-hmm. I always recommend to get an HVAC or air conditioning specialist to take a look at it because they, unlike a home inspector who's just going to measure the temperature of the air that's going into and out of the system. A specialist mm. will actually just, you know, take off the cover, connect all the gauges and make sure that it's functioning the way it was intended. That's where you really encounter the money pit situations where you purchase mm-hmm. a house because it looks cosmetically, it looks fantastic, but the underlying support systems are old and, and not functioning properly and you're constantly putting money into them. And air conditioning in particular can be very expensive. I mean, your typical yeah. HVAC service call is about $300. So you're not mm-hmm. going to get away from, from a cheap service call when it comes to HVAC problems. And you'll yeah. normally go through three or four of them before you decide ultimately to replace it. And so that, that's a sure way to avoid the money pit. Our first time around, we made that mistake with the new build. We thought, well, it's brand new. We don't need to have a home inspector, right? You know, because the developer had offered a year after we move in, you know, they'll fix up little things here and there. But I was surprised, even with a new build, there were certain things that weren't done correctly. You know, either they're rushing through it or someone just, you know, they have contractors, so the quality can can vary. So that's, I would definitely vouch for that to get that inspected, even if it's a new build. Of course, we hear with house hunting, it's all about location, location, location. And it's tough. Like you mentioned, it is a different market here in Raleigh. It's a hot market. Buying, you know, you're trying to find... Um, a good neighborhood, especially if you have kids, you're looking at the schools, but a lot of popular neighborhoods with premium. Is there any way for a couple that's researching or trying to look for neighborhoods to kind of, find, do you have any tips on finding hidden gems? You know, the best thing that I can recommend um, to finding homes with good value and good neighborhoods is to look at a, at a longer track record than what's trending today. Mm-hmm. Because what, what, you know, what I've seen in my experience, and, and we're talking 20 years in the real estate business, is that neighborhoods and areas, that everything operates on a cycle. So mm-hmm. as an example, here in the Raleigh area, uh, back in 2005, the Wake mm-hmm. Plantation neighborhood was immensely popular. Everybody mm-hmm. wanted to live in that neighborhood. Homes were selling for up to $200 a square foot. <sighs> and today, now, yeah. now we're, we're almost 15 years removed from that. And we encounter people that, that aren't able to sell their homes because of the price that they paid moving into it. It was, they mm-hmm. actually bought at the peak of the, of the, you know, the market in a really mm-hmm. trendy neighborhood. And so they, they paid a price. Now, obviously, there's value in use and value in trade, right? So mm-hmm. they got a lot of enjoyment out of it. It was a great neighborhood. got some prestige and cachet out of it. But now value in trade is not as high as they would want it to be. What I always recommend to people is pick an area that's convenient to you that, that supports your your particular lifestyle mm-hmm. uh, is close, you know, close proximity to your work and to the, your, the, the places that you normally visit. 
And then don't buy the most expensive home in the neighborhood. Don't buy the prettiest home in the neighborhood. I always recommend look for the home that has a, you know, that's not the shiny new coin in the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. We had a property that was on the market um, for some time and nobody was interested in buying this property. This property was $145,000. Uh, and it was down in Clayton. So it's a, it, was mm -hmm. a, it was a good value. It was a ranch style home. So all the bedrooms were on the ground floor. What I recommend for people is not to be attracted to the prettiest looking house in the neighborhood. Um, you mm -hmm. have a lot of investors that go into, into you know, trendy neighborhoods and they will do cosmetic updates. They'll replace kitchen cabinets. They, they, they'll refinish the floors. They give a nice paint job. It looks really beautiful. But the mm -hmm. underlying portions of the house, the foundation, the plumbing system, the mechanical are not in the best condition. And so people are paying you know, a premium because it looks great, but over time it creates maintenance problems for them. And they're really not going to derive as much benefit for them because when they go to resale, it's not going to be looking like that because mm -hmm. they're not going to spend the money updating it. And so you, you pay a premium for looking great, but then when it comes to resale, the price mm -hmm. is going to drop a little bit because now it's, it's more used, right? The same yeah. thing happens with new construction properties. A lot of people think that they'll buy a brand new home and then maybe in three to five years, they'll sell it and move somewhere else. Well, in reality, new construction, there is a very large premium between new construction and resale properties. And that could be as high as 20%. <sighs> and so what, what happens is within the first three years, at least in, in most areas, mm -hmm. your property has actually declined in value from what you paid for it. And you have to wait until the resale market comes up as it appreciates and reaches your price point, your entry point in that new construction home. And then it'll continue appreciating along with the rest of the market. Because the day after you move into a brand new home, now you're in a resale property. Because you're the only people that can sell new construction are builders. And that's it. Um, no matter mm -hmm. what you do, do it. Even if you completely renovate your home, you're still in the, compared to the resale market. And that market is, is you know, selling at a slight discount from new construction. So, um, you know, I worked with a lot of buyers that we would go look at houses and they would simply fall in love with the houses that investors, the savvy investors have just cleaned them up, made them look nice and shiny, and they're willing to pay top dollar for those. But if they look past that, look at their house in the same neighborhood that maybe hasn't been updated, the structure mm -hmm. is the same as, as the, the shiny new one, but maybe the flooring has to be replaced or the paint needs to be redone. You could save a considerable amount of money in that. Mm. I, in my 20 years, or actually now 30 years of home ownership, I have never bought the prettiest or nicest home in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I will look for a quality neighborhood and I'll buy the ugliest property that I can find in that neighborhood that suits my lifestyle. And then we'll mm -hmm. go ahead and fix it up and you can recover so much wealth that way um, just by minor updating and just improving the presentation of the property. I will say we got smarter the second time around and that's what we did. It's, it was dated, but it was solidly built, um, a little ranch home. And um, another good thing is it gives you flexibility. You know, if you know the, the mechanical, the structural things are fine, these updates you can base, you can it, get a good discount, you know, um, versus having it all put into the mortgage and you're locked in until, you know, you right. sell it. So yep. these are some fantastic tips, Lewis. I know we have some listeners that are in the area, the Triangle area. They're looking to buy a home. They're looking to sell a home. Could you tell them um, how they can reach out and maybe work with your team over at Daymark? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Daymark Realty is entirely owned by Coastal Credit Union. Uh, we're the largest private credit union in the Triangle area. And our number is 919-882-6700. And you can also find us at coastal24.com or daymarkrealty.com. Perfect. So I'm definitely going to put all of this in the show notes. And guys, uh, for you listening, we used Daymark when we were buying this property. We were so happy with the service that we got. So thank you so much, Louis, for coming on. Um, I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ellie. It's been a pleasure and I hope to see you again.